These interviews waded into contentious waters and divided viewers. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most controversial interviews. Got it. And Ryan is a paranoid schizophrenic paranoiac. Before we begin, we publish new videos every day, so be sure to subscribe for more great content. For this list, we're looking at interviews that were provocative for their content or circumstances and generated public discussion and debate. You look different than I remember. <laughs> Number 10, Tom Cruise and Matt Lauer. And I know that uh, psychiatry is is a pseudoscience. This 2005 interview was supposed to be about the War of the Worlds, but it soon devolved into a war of words. I understand Do, there's no. abuse of all of these things. No, you see, here's the problem. You don't know the history of psychiatry. I do. Things started out with a few questions about Scientology, but then took a different track. It's where it Matt, works. Matt, Matt, you, you don't even, you're glib. You don't even know what Ritalin is. When Lauer asked Cruz about his criticism of Brooke Shields for her use of medication to treat postpartum depression, the star launched into an incensed rant against Ritalin and psychiatry. Pretty serious stuff for a celebrity interview. Knowing I'm really, not prescribing Ritalin, Tom, and I'm not well, asking anyone else to do well, it. Lauer tried to hold his own, but in the end, he just didn't know what Tom Cruise knows. When you don't know, and I do. Number nine, Sarah Palin and Katie Couric. But he still has a stake in the company, so isn't that a conflict of interest? It was hard not to cringe during this train wreck of an interview with CBS Evening News anchor Katie Couric. If 2008 vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin had expected Couric to go easy, she and the viewing public soon learned otherwise. Newspapers and magazines did you regularly read before you were tapped for this to stay informed and to understand the I've world. read most of them, again, with a great appreciation for the press, for the media. But like what coming, specifically? I'm curious that you... Um, all of them. Broadcast over several segments, Kirk's questions were direct, and Palin's answers were, well, less so. Palin's insistence that she had foreign policy experience because Russia is right next door to Alaska didn't exactly help. Alaska has a very narrow maritime border between a foreign country, Russia, and on our other side, the land uh, boundary that we have with uh, Canada. Palin came off looking unnerved and ill-informed, which she later blamed on Couric. I did feel that there were a lot of things that she was missing in terms of an opportunity to ask what a VP candidate stands for. Number eight, Monica Lewinsky and Barbara Walters. I don't think I don't think that my relationship hurt the job he was doing. It didn't hurt the work I was doing. It wasn't the first time Barbara Walters had a woman spill the beans on her lover, but few interviews have been as anticipated as her 1999 sit down with Monica Lewinsky, the month after Bill Clinton was acquitted of perjury and obstruction of justice. I wouldn't dream of asking Chelsea and Mrs. Clinton to forgive me, but I would ask them to know that I am very sorry for what happened and for what they've been through. The former White House intern apologized to Clinton's wife and daughter and said the president was a, quote, good kisser. And he kissed you? Yes. What'd you think? He's a good kisser. <laughs> Millions of viewers watched as Walters grilled Lewinsky on her affairs with married men, only to reveal her own in an autobiography years later. Number seven, Charlie Sheen on ABC and NBC. Us winning. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. In 2011, soon after leaving the sitcom Two and a Half Men, Charlie Sheen gave a series of interviews that were strange to say the least. The star of Oliver Stone's Platoon launched into bombastic rants during a string of interviews on ABC and NBC, claiming he had tiger blood and Adonis DNA. When you got tiger blood and Adonis DNA, man, it's like, get get with the program, dude. He also admitted to using drugs, a drug called Charlie Sheen. Hey, sometimes you just gotta be honest. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I am on a drug, it's called Charlie Sheen. His grandiose pronouncements ignited speculation regarding his mental state and continued drug use. And this wouldn't be the last time his personal life hit headlines. I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Number six, Joan Juliet Buck and Syrian First Lady Asma al-Assad. Do you feel like a fool? Um, I feel like a fool vis-a-vis Asma al-Assad. Somehow it seemed like a good idea at the time, 
right before the outbreak of the Syrian Civil War. Vogue sent writer Joan Juliet Buck to interview Syrian First Lady Asma al-Assad for their 2011 power issue. In a naive and flattering fluff piece published just as the government cracked down on protesters, Buck painted the Assads as charitable and, quote, wildly democratic proponents of peace. According to Buck, she begged her editors not to run it. But Vogue forged ahead, ruining Buck's career, and later removing the article from their website. I got flattered into doing it, and of course I regret it. Number 5. Lance Armstrong and Oprah Winfrey Those are my words. For almost two decades, he was a hero for many. And for some, Lance Armstrong is still remembered for his dramatic comeback from cancer in the late 90s. I've said it for seven years. I've said it for longer than seven years. I have never doped. But in 2012, the disgraced cyclist was banned from competition and stripped of all seven Tour de France titles for using performance-enhancing drugs. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. His tense interview with Oprah marked his first public admission, confirming what many had long suspected. Doping in the sport was widespread, and Armstrong had been using banned substances since early in his career. Was it humanly possible to win the Tour de France without doping? Seven times in a row. Not in my opinion. Number four, Megyn Kelly and Alex Jones. So again. Well, you're trying to have it always. Right? No, I'm not. Incendiary shock jock Alex Jones thrives on provocation. He's infamous for claiming the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre was all a hoax and for going bananas in interviews. If I wanted to get no, rid no. of it's, it's, it's to point out you're a foreigner, a red coat, outrageous. here telling us what to do. Whatever. Go back to where they took the guns if you don't like it. So when Megyn Kelly interviewed Jones for NBC in 2017, the network was criticized for airing his views at all. But here's the thing. Alex Jones isn't going away. Kelly countered that his opinions have to be addressed and pressed Jones hard as the conspiracy theorists scramble to cover all bases. Right. But Alex, the parents, one after the other, devastated. The dead bodies that the coroner autopsy. And they blocked all that and they won't release any of it? That's, that's unprecedented? Nonetheless, the backlash continued when Jones released tapes of Kelly promising to show viewers quote, the dad in him. And Rolling Stone magazine brought up the ghost of Kelly's Fox News past to suggest she had helped foster the culture that made Jones popular. All I can do is give you my word and tell you, I, if there's one thing about me, I do what I say I'm going to do. Number three, Sean Penn and El Chapo. Quiero dejar en claro el contenido de esta entrevista es exclusivo para la señorita Kay del Castillo y el señor Sean Penn. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman had the dubious honor of being the most powerful drug lord in the world. The head of Mexico's Sinaloa cartel was a wanted fugitive when actor Sean Penn interviewed him for Rolling Stone in 2015. Penn's in was actress Kate Del Castillo, who El Chapo had invited to meet him. El Chapo boasted that he trafficked more drugs than anyone else in the world, but reactions focused on the ethical and legal issues of the interview. Seems the magazine didn't inform the authorities and promised the drug baron editorial control. In the end, El Chapo must regret the meeting most. It inadvertently helped police locate him anyway, leading to his latest arrest. It's Number two, David Frost and Richard Nixon. That's your conclusion. It is. Uh, but now let's look at the facts. Nixon's name has become synonymous with political scandal, which wasn't the personal legacy the disgraced ex-president had in mind for himself. But through his interviews with Robert Frost, Nixon hoped to restore his image and mitigate the political fallout of Watergate. Do you feel that you ever obstructed justice or were part of a conspiracy? To obstruct justice? Arguably, Nixon got the best of early one-on-ones, but then Frost pulled out his secret weapon, a transcript of a damning conversation between Nixon and aide Charles Colson, proving Nixon's knowledge of the cover-up. Now somewhere you were pretty well informed by that conversation on June 20th. Outfoxed, Nixon disassembled, but with his back against the wall, finally apologized to the nation. I let the American people down. And I have to carry that burden with me for the rest of my life. My political life is over. 
Before we reveal the identity of our top pick, here are some dishonorable mentions. Uh, okay, I'm being pulled away. You know, we, we, we turned down another interview for this. We don't do crack. We don't do that. Your crack is whack. Direct war. Yeah. Well, we see that happening. The other thing is with the terrorists, you have to take out their families. When you get these terrorists, you have to take out their families. Number one, Michael Jackson and Martin Bashir. How do you write a song? How do you write a song? How do I write a song? Well, in 2002 and 2003, British journalist Martin Bashir was given unprecedented access to the reclusive king of pop for his film Living with Michael Jackson. It was an interview Jackson would regret. The film included Jackson's claim that his father had been abusive, but also the revelation that Jackson sometimes had sleepovers with children. I slept on the floor. Uh, was it sleeping bag? The interview ignited a media and legal firestorm. While Jackson said he felt, quote, utterly betrayed, and U.S. reviewers accused Bashir of using manipulative tactics, new allegations of child molestation divided the public and continued to cast a cloud over Jackson's legacy. That's, that's not a worrying thing. Why should it be worrying? Who's the criminal? Who's, who's Jack the Ripper in the room? Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from WatchMojo and subscribe for new videos every day.